Thank you, Bailey. I told Bailey just before the service that I played a dirty trick on her. Um, when I get to the last half of the passage, I'm not going to use those hard words. <laughs> uh, my name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC. It is great to have you here. Um, for those who are visiting, if you're wondering why I'm sitting, it's because I had ankle surgery on June 27th. They took out about um, 60 to 70 percent of my Achilles tendon and replaced it with something else um, from someone who didn't need it anymore, apparently. Um, so I'm still not quite strong enough to stand, and uh, you know, at least not for a three or four hour sermon. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but don't worry, I, I understand my responsibilities are to get us out of here in time for the Cowboys game, um, which is at 3 o'clock, so get comfortable. Um, there is a restaurant that lives in infamy in my marriage. It is called Tejas de Brazil. Anne and I have been there once, years ago. And we are not going back because it would be devastating to our marriage. First, it's expensive. So that's problem number one. But the bigger problem is the food is amazing. And here's how Tejas de Brazil works. First off, they have this huge buffet that is set up in the center of the room, and this buffet has appetizers and sides and salads and soups and desserts and who knows what else. But this thing is huge, and everything on it is just incredible. But that's not the most dangerous part. The most dangerous part is that there are these, I don't know, messengers from God <laughs> that walk around the restaurant carrying big slabs of meat, all kinds of meat, all kinds of amazing, amazing meat. And they will come by your table and they will just cut off slices and put it on your plate, and they just keep coming. <laughs> they, they are like a Texas downpour. They just keep coming, and they don't stop until your wife butts in and says something crazy like, enough, you're done. <laughs> what do you mean I'm done? The guys are still walking around the restaurant. The place doesn't close for another eight hours. I am not done. That's the one time in our marriage that Anne has actually had to hold up a stop sign in a restaurant. And it was ugly, and I'm still not over it. That's a silly story, but it's interestingly symbolic. There are things in my life that I can enjoy so much that I don't realize that they're hurting me. There are things that I can become so enslaved to that I don't even know that I'm in slavery. Right? Here's a more serious example that you might be able to relate to. I can become so concerned about what you think of me that you liking what I say becomes more important than me accurately handling God's word, either in a sermon or in a counseling session. And so I can be tempted to downplay or ignore certain truths because I don't want to risk you not liking me. Here's the thing. One of the most common parts of my week is dealing with people who are deeply enslaved and they don't know it. They have a picture of life, what it's supposed to look like, what kind of family they're supposed to have, what kind of income they should have, what kind of friends they should have. And if they have those things, then they fight desperately to keep it. 
And if they don't have those things, they feel like they are complete failures and life has let them down. It's a slavery, but they never think of it that way because they are certain that what they are enslaved to is really where they're going to find happiness or contentment. They're like a donkey that's being led by a carrot. They think that what they're following is going to make them happy. But what's really going on is they're pulling a cart and they're being led by someone else. Every person in this room, including me, lives in slavery that we don't fully realize that we're in. It looks a little different for each one of us. Some of us are so enslaved by fear of rejection that we will never have the loving but hard conversation that we need to have with someone who's hurt us. And so we live without knowing the joy of a restored relationship. Some of us are so entranced by the prestige and comfort that comes from wealth that we live enslaved to the fear that we will lose what we have or that we never have enough. Some of us are so convinced that our performance is what makes us acceptable That we live in fear of things like bad grades. There are many, many forms of slavery. In fact, I would say there are many different types of slavery as there are people in this room. When you first read the book of Micah, it doesn't look like it's about this kind of slavery, but it is. It's answering the question... How do we find freedom from the things that enslave us that we don't even know enslave us? And chapter 1 of Micah gets us into the issues by getting us below the surface. It gets us into the idolatry that subtly enters our lives and it reintroduces us to the God who deserves our awe and wonder. The book opens in verse 1 with information about the, about the background, about the setting, about what's going on in the time of Micah. Now, we know very little about Micah himself. We know that his name means literally, who is like Yahweh? Who is like God? Verse 1 tells us that he's from Morasheth. That's a small town, but it's likely a place that people would go through traveling to and from Jerusalem. So it'd be a place where there'd be a lot of information and Micah would be aware of what's going on in the rest of the kingdom. We know the name of three kings that lived during the time of Micah's ministry. Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. That tells us that Micah probably prophesied during the period of 740 to 687, sometime in that range, and we are certain that it was towards the beginning of that range, maybe all the way through to the end. Now, by this time, what you need to know is that the nation had actually been split into two kingdoms, and that had happened about 200 years before. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom, and that northern kingdom was still called itself Israel. Jerusalem was actually the capital of the southern kingdom, which is called Judah at that point. Now, you can't see it on this map, but if you were to go up to the far right corner beyond that map, so to the northeast, you would see Assyria. And Assyria is an important player in this book. And they're going to be very important in Israel's situation. Now, there are three things that you need to know about the situation facing Israel and Judah. First, they were incredibly prosperous. They were doing extremely well economically. Their cities were respected. Their cities were beautiful, especially Samaria and Jerusalem. These were people that were considered influencers in that part of the world. But the second thing you need to know is that they were extremely corrupt. The political, economic, and even religious leaders were making money from themselves, for themselves, by stealing from the poor and the powerless. And then the third thing you need to know is that I've already alluded to is that Assyria was on the rise. And in fact... If Micah started his ministry in 740, 
we are less than 20 years away from Assyria coming down and wiping out Samaria. And so some of the very prophecies that Bailey read for us this morning are about to come true within 20 years. One last thing about the background from verse 1 that's worth noting. It's the name of God that's used. If you were to translate the first part of verse 1, this is literally how you would translate it. The word of Yahweh, which was to who is like Yahweh. The book opens with an emphasis on the name Yahweh. See, that's the name that God uses to emphasize his special covenant relationship with his people. It's a relationship where he promises to care for them and watch over them. And they, in return, would reflect his character to the rest of the world. But the people had stopped reflecting his character. In fact, they were reflecting the thinking and the values of the nations around them. The very people that they were supposed to show God's character to. Micah's core message is that all this is about to change. God's character is about to be revealed because God's going to show up in a very powerful way and deal with his people. And so the background of Micah that we need to take away is that God speaks to his people during a time of prosperity, corruption, and international intrigue. And the message that God speaks starts with, I am coming, and I am coming with authority. And that's what we see in verses 2 through 5. Okay, quick poll. Who here remembers the first time they ever watched the movie, the original, Jurassic Park? Okay, excellent. Then this has a chance of working. There is a scene in that movie... That the first time you watch it, it kind of creates this sense of tension. It's actually one of the iconic scenes in the movie, and it it involves two plastic cups of water. Remember what I'm talking about? You hear off in the distance impact tremors, and the camera focuses in on one of the cups of water. And every time there's impact, the water ripples. And you know what's coming. Something big, something scary, something with teeth. A T-Rex is coming. Five years after that movie was released, there was a terrific movie trailer that was released for another movie. And it picks up on that scene. The scene takes place in a museum where there is a huge skeleton of a T-Rex and a class is coming in. And in that class, there's this little blonde girl that looks kind of like the blonde girl in Jurassic Park. And and they kind of focus on her. And then all of a sudden, you hear tremors. But this time, it's not water that's rippling. There is dust that comes down from the T-Rex, that comes down from the ceiling. And the camera widens And you see this full T-Rex skeleton and you know, you know a T-Rex is about to come around the corner. And instead, a foot comes through the ceiling and crushes the T-Rex. And the point of the trailer is you have not seen a big lizard until you have seen Godzilla. (laughs) And the trailer was brilliant because it left you saying, wow, that is terrifyingly impressive. And when you get to verse 2 of Micah 1, that's the gut level emotional reaction that the original audience would have had to these opening verses. Wow, Yahweh is terrifyingly impressive. But the difference is that they knew they weren't watching a trailer for a fictitious movie. What they were getting was a picture of something real that was coming. 
And the picture is of the whole world watching as God comes from heaven. And if you thought it was impressive that Godzilla could put a foot through a building, guess what Yahweh does? When Yahweh steps on Mount Everest, it melts like butter. When Yahweh steps on the Grand Canyon, the sides of the valley split apart. Now, obviously, this is figurative language, but Micah is making a point. God is about to act with power and authority and with a power and authority that his people had forgotten that he possessed. And that's really the core issue. They had lost their vision of who God is. And so God is about to restore that vision to them. By dealing with their idolatry. Because in losing that vision. They had lost their role. Of what they were supposed to be doing. To represent God's character. To the world. And God is going to restore them to that purpose. God's people lost sight. Of God's wonder and majesty. They stopped being in awe of him. And when we stop being in awe of God, there is an inevitable result. We are going to be in awe of something else. So God begins the book of Micah by restoring and expanding their understanding of his wonder and his majesty. Now, this is a very good place for us to start as well. We live in a culture that if it thinks about God at all, has a very domesticated vision of who God is. We think of God as loving, and that's good. But does our culture think that God makes any demands on us? If you begin to suggest that God has legitimate expectations of us, our culture thinks you're crazy and a fanatic. right? Our culture is fine with saying God is compassionate. That's good. That's a true statement. But there is no way our culture thinks that God has any sort of opinion on how we use our money or how we use our time. Our culture doesn't think that God cares if we tell the truth or if we take the effort to restore broken relationships. One of the most helpful things that you can do to guard yourself against domesticating God is to constantly ask yourself, what is that saying about who God is? Every sermon that you listen to, ask the question, what is it saying about who God is? Every time you open the Bible to read it, or you're in a Bible study, ask the question, what is it saying about who God is? When we hear the stories, when we hear the Rispins share their stories of how God is at work through them to bring a a new life the healing to the lives of children all over the world. Ask yourself the question, what are these stories of how God is working say about who our God is? Because we need to continue to drive home what our God is truly like. Verses 2 through 5 picture God showing up in a way that will restore the sense of awe and wonder that his people should never have lost. He is going to show up with authority. And the reason is laid out in the rest of the chapter. But really we see the focus of it in verses 5 through 9. And that reason is idolatry. Verse 5 introduces us to their idolatry. We're going to get into a lot more detail as we go through the book. But here's what I want you to take away at this point. Their idolatry was willful. And their idolatry was pervasive. The word translated transgression in verse 5 refers to willful, criminal violation of a covenant. Now, what was the Jews' part of their covenant with God? It was to be a people who represented his character to the world. And what verse 5 is saying is that they knowingly and willfully decided that they were not going to carry out their part of the covenant. Verses 5 also, five and 6 also hint at idolatry's pervasiveness. Verse 5 says that the city of Samaria, 
the capital of Israel, was itself a transgression. What an odd thing to say. The city itself is a willful act of violating their covenant with God. Well, here's what's going on. Samaria was a city with just beautiful stonework. It was built up on a hill. And what that made Samaria was two things. Incredibly impressive to look at and almost impossible to invade. And its people were incredibly proud of what they had accomplished in building that city. And so we see in verse 6 that what God is going to do is he is going to step in and deal with the very things that they were in awe of. He is going to flatten the top of the mountain and he is going to crush their beautiful stonework. They had become more in awe of themselves and their city than they were of God. And that is idolatry. Verses 5 and 9 show us how this extends to Jerusalem in the southern kingdom. It calls Jerusalem the high place of Judah. High places were the places that the people went to worship pagan gods. So catch what this is saying. This is saying that Jerusalem itself was a place of pagan worship. And it's not just because they built idols to false gods, although undoubtedly that was one part of it. What we're going to see as we go through Micah is that Micah is far more concerned about the worship of greed and power. Verse 9 is saying that the disease of Samaria, their awe of wealth, their awe of power, their awe of beauty, their awe of themselves, has reached Judah and infected the nation's leaders in Jerusalem. That was the idolatry that Micah faced. God's people had replaced awe of God with awe of self. And they were overly impressed with what they had accomplished. When I honestly look at my life, I look at how I think, how I act, how I relate to people, especially when I look at what I'm afraid of, what stresses me out, or what makes me happy, it reveals how much I live like my well-being Depends on people's approval. That is my idol. I live as if people have the power to give or take away an abundant life. That means there's a big part of me that is in awe of people and their approval. And I'm in awe of myself because I believe I have the power to achieve it. And to the degree that I am in awe of people's approval and my ability to get it, I will live blind to my slavery to try to achieve that approval. So the question is, what are you in awe of? When you look at what stresses you, what gives you happiness, what you value, how you think, how you relate to people, what do you think an abundant life actually depends on. God comes with authority to a people who lost sight of his majesty and they become more in awe of themselves than they were of God. And the rest of the chapter shows that God comes with authority to remove idols. Verses 6 and 7 tell us that God is going to take away the very things that they are proud of. We already saw that in verse Five and six with Samaria. He's going to make the mountaintops city of Samaria a heap in an open country. He's going to crush their beautiful stonework, smash their idols. He's going to burn their wealth. But then verses 10 through 16 do something really amazing that we miss in English. But you see it when you understand the meanings behind the names of the places mentioned in these verses. Here are verses 10 and 11, and I've translated the names of the cities into English, so unlike Bailey, I wouldn't have to say the hard words. Do you catch what it's saying here? Tell it not in Telltown. 
weep not at all. In the house of dust, roll yourselves in the dust. Pass on your way, inhabitants of beauty town, in nakedness and shame. The inhabitants of exit town do not come out. The lamentation of neighbor town shall take away from you its standing place. And the rest of the chapter is just like that. Now, we think that's pretty clever. That's poetic. But that is not how the original audience would have heard this. You see, names meant something to these people. Cities, just like people, were given names to represent their identity. It is who they were. It's what they were proud of. The best example I can think of for us would be Silicon Valley. It's a name that we give to a specific place because when we say the name, we want people to think of the creativity and the productivity and the wealth that's generated by a specific industry in a specific location. So Telltown is probably a city that saw itself as a town with something to say. And Micah says they will be made silent. The house of dust was probably in the desert. And they are told to go ahead and roll in the dust because that's what you did in that society when you were in grief and you were in pain. Beauty Town was probably the sort of place you would go on vacation. But it becomes a place where people live in shame. Exit Town was probably part of a strategic route. But it leaves its people with no escape. And there will be no neighbors left in neighbor town. This message was terrifying to them. God was threatening their very identity. And here's the thing. When God starts to threaten your idols, I promise you it will terrify you and you will fight him at every turn. Why? Because you and I believe deep down that a good life depends on that idol. And when it gets threatened, we will fight. Bad news for those of us who are pastors. Our job description is basically to remove idols from people's lives. That's the underlying question that comes up again and again in Micah and really in the whole Bible. What is the good life? What is the abundant life? The people in Micah's day said that the good life was having wealth and power and approval from society's influencers. It was having something to say. It was to be beautiful. It was to be important. It was to be well-liked, just like the names of their town suggested. And our culture is just like their culture. If you want a sense of well-being, if you want to know that you've made it, If you want to be able to say life is good, then what you need is wealth or power or approval or acceptance or beauty or influence. People are so in love with those things that they live enslaved to gain them and then fighting to keep them. And they don't even know that they are enslaved. They have become enslaved to false gods. And they are terrified when God works to free them. When I was a kid, I remember playing with some old wooden crutches. I have no idea whose they were. I have no idea even how I got a hold of them. I think they were in my grandparents' garage. But here's the great thing about these crutches. It was missing one of its bolts. One of them was. So here's the problem. If you put too much weight on that crutch or it hit at a funny angle, part of that crutch went whoop and it would start to collapse. I think I spent probably 10 minutes at the most playing with the crutch and then I thought this is stupid. I'm never going to need crutches in my life. Well, now that I've been on crutches the past few months or so, um, I've had occasion to think back on what it would have been like 
if I really had to rely on those old wooden crutches. Think about how incredibly careful and conscious I would have to be about the crutches themselves to make sure that they held me. I would constantly be stressing over how much weight was I putting on? Where was I stepping? Was I, have, was I holding the crutch at the right angle? Probably should just get a bolt. Um, but the fact is, I would be more worried about the crutches than anything else. That's exactly what it's like when we have the wrong picture of the good life. Whatever wrong idea you have, will never support you. Wealth, power, influence will enslave you because you will live in competition with those who have more and fear losing what you have. And the same is true for beauty, acceptance, intelligence. And so here's the solution, and it's a solution that Micah is going to present. You need the right picture of the good life. And here's the truth that needs to get pounded deeper and deeper into our souls by the Holy Spirit. The good life is a life lived in right relationship with God. It is a life that reflects His character. Why is that the good life? Because it never depends on circumstances. In fact, it gives us the tools to respond to any life circumstance with wisdom and contentment, whether it's wealth or poverty, power or powerlessness, acceptance or rejection. Those things might be pleasing, they might be painful, but they will not be enslaving. What is God doing when he shows up with authority to remove his people's idols? He's taking away their broken crutches He is getting them back to the life that they were designed to live. The only life that ultimately brings contentment and abundance. God shows up in Micah and in our lives with an authority we cannot imagine because we have domesticated God. Micah reminds us of the awe that comes from encountering the true God. Who is like Yahweh, no one. And there's no one close. God shows up in Micah in our lives because of our tendency to be more in awe of ourselves than we are in God. And then God goes to work to dismantle the idols that we have built into our lives. And that's really the point of chapter one, and that's the point of the message. God removes your broken crutches. There are things that lead us into slavery with a smile on our face and the applause of our culture. We call them wealth, power, influence, adoration, etc. God calls them idols. We will de- he will deal with our idols. Not because he's mean, but because he wants us to be free to live the truly good the truly abundant life. So how do we respond? Suggest three things. Ask God to show you the idolatry in your life. Start with prayer. Start with prayer. Go before the Lord. Go to the Holy Spirit and say, where am I looking for the good life, for abundance in something other than living in relationship with you and reflecting your character? Go through the discussion questions with someone this week. We are not meant to live the Christian life in isolation on our own. Take some time and honestly go through these questions to reflect on how God is at work and how God needs to be at work in your life. And then I want to encourage you to again, read through the book of Micah. It's not that long. It's seven chapters. You don't have to do it all at once, but just read through the book of Micah. There is, on the back of this little handout that you got when you came in, there's a place for you to indicate how you want to respond to this message. Why do we give that to you? Because there are boxes in the foyer on either the right or left-hand side that we encourage you to fill that out and put those in the boxes. 
And then our staff takes those and we pray for those every week. We want to see the Holy Spirit work in your lives as you seek to apply God's word and become more and more like Christ. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. As they come forward, I'm going to join you in standing. Our prayer team is a group of men and women who are here to pray with you no matter what you are facing. If you want to know more, who is Yahweh? What is he like? Please come talk to these folks. That's what they are here for. If you're struggling with, I have circumstances in my life that I'm not sure what God is doing. I'm not sure how God's at work. These people want to pray with you. Please come join them. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, Yahweh, we are reminded that there is no one like you. You show up in Micah and you show up in our lives with incredible power. But Lord, also with incredible compassion because what you seek to do is to identify those very things that we are depending on to make life work, to make life good, to make life worthwhile, that will unfailingly let us down. So Lord, we thank you for that work in our lives of removing idols, as painful and as difficult as it may be. And Lord, we ask for your help even this week that we would be more and more aware of the idolatry in our lives and that we'd be more and more committed to joining you in your work of removing them. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Here is my parting thought for you. Don't domesticate God, don't lose sight of his terrifying, but wonderful character. And so as you leave here, leave here committed that you will know that character more and more every day. You're dismissed.